you know, after Brexit, Nicola Sturgeon, you know, you know, because you had in two thousand fourteen, you had the Scottish independent referendum, which was a very strong no, thank you. We want to be part of the United Kingdom. Two thousand fifteen election, SNP swept across most of Scotland via you know one or two seats, and then this election, you know, just you know, just over half. Do you think? Do you think you know people have said you know actually no, we've already voted you know quite recently that we don't want a referendum. Nicola Sturgeon, you know, do one. We don't want another one. Yeah. Do you think this also calls for Nicola Sturgeon to resign? Um, Nicola, Nicola Sturgeon, I'm not too in the know about Nicola Sturgeon and her policies and everything. Um, but she, I don't know if she should resign or not. Well, she's, do, she's been there for a while now and people are starting to get a bit annoyed because she, one of her main, one of the main things she's campaigning for is the Scottish independence and they've already had that referendum. So do you think it's too soon to... Well, um, no, I, I pro- she probably should should resign if it's a big enough demand for her to resign. Maybe get someone else in there, maybe have someone who d- actually was a stay. Yeah, but pe- pe- you know, people could always say, you know, that like so S and P has suffered huge losses losses there. So here, you know, last election, fifty six seats, now only thirty five seats. But people could also say the same for Theresa May. You know, she she called this election thinking, you know, clean sweep, you know, 80 plus majority or so was predicted. And now she's coming, you know, just short of majority to, you know, you know, look there, look, seven seats. So 319 is the forecast at the moment, you know, just seven. If that's correct, that's seven sheets, you know, short of a majority. Do you know, do you think if so, let's say Nicola Sturgeon, you know, did decide to resign, Luis, do you think that's fair, you know, that Theresa May should resign as well? Or do you think she hasn't suffered massive losses compared to the last election, for example? You know, you know, not looking at exit polls or anything. Well, I don't think because you don't get the result you want, you should resign. To be honest. Um, so I do mean, you think you know? I don't think she should resign. I mean, she's being she's only looking for the Scottish independence uh, of the UK, but. I don't think she should necessarily resign, no, but I, I think know. she should go up a bit less on the Scottish independence. Yeah, like because they've already had a vote and they voted to remain part of the UK. So, so do you think the clear message is, you know, pipe down, Nicola, we've just had or, it? Or, or if people, like the moment people start going on about her resigning, then I think she should. But if people don't go on, a, on about her resigning like that much, I think it's fine. Yeah, if they're still happy to have her at the party, then, yeah. then there's no need for her to resign. But yeah, if people people are starting to get a bit annoyed by the seems of by, by the by the figures by the fact that they've lost loads of seats, twenty one seats. Yeah. So, or S and P or Conservative. S and P or Conservative, which one have lost loads of seats? Sorry, I switched off. S and P. S and P. Okay, so yeah, so just showed that minus twenty one seats from the last election, but Conservative are only on. Oh, wait, wait for the graphic to come up again. Uh, ah, sorry, minus twelve seats. Uh, but Conservative only last, only just getting a majority last time. Do you think, you know, considering results of last election, just over majority with 331 seats, do you think Theresa May was, you know, a bit too cocky on calling this one? Definitely. I think she was. I think she fully expected just a clean sweep and an easy victory. Yeah. She wasn't expecting Corbyn to have that much of an impact within young people. Mm. Yeah. Corbyn, I don't Corbyn think saw. anyone was, to be honest. Yeah. Corbyn's campaign was very successful compared to Theresa May's. But, you know, I, I was also reading this morning, you know, that Corbyn has spent most of his like time as a member of parliament, a politician, out campaigning for stuff, whether it's been nuclear disarmament, uh, you know, legalising things, you know, stopping war, for example. He's, you know, in part of his, most of his career has been, you know, out talking to people, campaigning, and Theresa May necessarily hasn't. Theresa May, you know, yeah. has been, you know, quite lucky in the sense of a politician, you know. Mm-hmm. She was Home Secretary for six years, you know, quite a reserved MP. But then you have Jeremy Corbyn, who's quite outlandish. I wouldn't say rec- reckless, but he's quite, like, outspoken and straight to the point. And do you think people are now wanting that kind of honest, straight-to-the-point politics. Yeah, I think people are getting fed up of the lies politicians tell. The promises, the promises, the promises. But, but, people, but, people, as well, but yeah, but people, yeah, exactly my point. You, people could also say, you know, that he he was reckless in the sense, you know, he's doing all the, loads of promises with actually yeah. no, you know, people are saying, you know, people say, oh yeah, the Labour manifesto here is fully costed, but mm. put it into practice. Can it be fully costed? I think what he's saying is almost too much what everyone wants. Like the whole minimum wage being raised, free tuition fees, all of this stuff. It's 
what everyone wants, but to a point that it's almost like, is it possible? Like or is he just saying kind that? Kind of fair trying to say it. It's yeah. kind of, yeah, it's, is he just saying that because he knows that all loads of young people are going to want that, so they're going to be like, yeah, I'm going to vote for him, but is it actually going to work? And, and is it, like, realistic? An argument against that is people can say, people say is you, you need to dream to be able to actually achieve something. So if you don't dream of actually doing what you what you want or what people want, then it won't be achieved at all. But there is still a limit. There is still a limit. I think like he got up. Sorry. No, it's fine. Go ahead. I think he got a bit overexcited as the campaign was going. Yeah. Through. Like maybe so if he include le- included less of his uh, less of the less policies, because we, we've got we've got the two manifestos on here, and the Labour one is almost twice the size of the Conservative one. But but so p- people have also said to Jeremy Corbyn as well, you know, throughout his campaign, he hasn't n- like no, not neither party has really spoken much about Brexit. No. Let's get to the point. The whole the whole reason we're having this general election is because of Brexit. And Theresa May, you know, for okay, I think I don't think necessarily in the sense she was power hungry, like because she she was prime already prime minister at the end of the day. I think she got because she was always you know in Parliament, you know, getting comments like you weren't elected in, we don't want you here. And I think you know you know you're not you're not here to you know you shouldn't lead Brexit because you weren't voted in. So I think actually what she's done is actually in a sense so people could slate her you know for calling this and you know trashing the country for example. But actually she's let the people decide. But I think based on the basis of Brexit, but you know n- no no campaign has been you know about Brexit. What I saw earlier, like I said, was that someone had said she like did that. And she called it, and maybe she thought they were going to vote her in, and then she'd actually have the, like, right, and she'd have power, and people would finally accept her and be like, yeah, this is our Prime Minister, we need to get on with it. But it's completely turned around, and the media has just slated her for a very long time and said that she isn't right for the job, and she isn't worthy. And now it's just sort of been proved a bit, but, like, at the same time it hasn't, because... So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, mm, theoretically. Yeah, yeah. So, with, with what you were saying, do you reckon um, he, she called the snap election on the fact that she was fed up of what people were saying? I think I think that she called it in the sense of, so people decided on the referendum, people decided against what, you know, most major parties were campaigning against, you know, by the odd one, like UKIP, for example. Um, you know, and I think, like, I think on the basis of that, you know, she was like, so you just let people, so, so Brexit was the main issue, we had this, and I think her theory was, so we've had Brexit now, let people decide who they want to lead Brexit. And yeah. I think she thought, you know, I'm the one here who's talking about triggering Article 50. If I go in right in before the election, trigger Article Article 50, how will my plans laid out? You know, it'll just be a clean sweep election, sure. which it hasn't been in the case. You know, she was predicted an 80-seat majority, but she's just, you know, fallen seven seats before forecasted to fall seven seats short of a majority. So you think she was trying to make it more democratic? Than it was. I think she was trying to make it demonstrate. It wasn't the sense of, you know, she was there power hungry, like, you know, I want to officially be Prime Minister, because at the end of the day, she already was Prime Minister. Mm-hmm. I think she wanted to, you know, let people decide who do they want to lead the country through Brexit. And I feel like Jeremy Corbyn has been not really focusing on Brexit, he's been f- trying to push away issues, because mm. I don't, because, you know, looking at the manifesto, there's more stuff here about the NHS, which, don't get me wrong, is important, but Brexit is the main issue we're having this, and mm. that, that I think that should be the main vocal point. An argument towards that was in in the NHS. I know someone who works in the NHS, and I've seen a lot of what doctors have been saying, and they've not not seen it. What, they've not seen it this bad as it is right now, for years. Like the, this person I, I was talking to, um, has worked in the NHS for fourteen years, and it's the it's worst it's ever been right now. But could you say could you say for example, say the NHS over the years, you know, hasn't really expanded much due to you know growing you know population, immigration, which isn't a bad thing. I'm not you know, it isn't a bad thing. Um, but hasn't really had the chance to have a massive spending put towards it and hasn't had the chance to grow. And a lot of people are saying, you know, the NHS, you know, I read an article about how, like, the failure of the NHS isn't necessarily spending, it's people abusing it, you know, going to hospital for a stubbed toe, you know, that's wasting a hospital bed, theoretically. You mentioned um, the immigration and the NHS there. Um, immigration also very much helps our NHS. Yeah, but isn't a lot it 50% of, our of the workforce or so yeah. is immigration? Yeah, and we've got a lot more, a lot fantastic doctors coming over from multiple other countries helping our NHS be what it is and help it survive, help the people in that hospital. In, in fact, I don't think our NHS could exist right now without the immigration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But do you, do you think, you know, people might be abusing the NHS a little bit? Um, like I've read this massive uh, rant, rant someone had on Twitter 
about you know people you know not really needing to get paracetamol on prescription because you know if you actually add up all in total it costs so the average so for example uh, I know someone who actually has you know paracetamol on prescription mm. two a day works out forty five p a week but she gets it on prescription. The problem is the that we're told to use our GPs a lot more than actually going to NHS and A and E and everything like this. But our G, local GPs are all full up, and we really struggle to get appointments. Like I had, I, I had an appointment for something a few weeks ago. Um, it was, it was quite. I wanted to get it checked quite bad. I had to wait in the end because I didn't want to go and clog up A and E. But I had to wait three weeks to find out what it was, and by that time the problem had gone. So I booked an appointment and everything, and by the time I actually got the appointment or got to the appointment, it had my problem had gone. So I still went. I still got it checked. But it's so, just really, really busy in our GPs. So what what would you say? So in an ideal world, let's go around the table here and discuss what in an ideal world, what would you do with the NHS, you know, to order, you know, to stop this crisis? What do you think, rather than saying, you know, increased spending, which, don't get me wrong, is needed, and actually the Conservative government have come out and said, you know, we are going to increase it actually by two billion, well, I read somewhere, I don't know how much this is true, because actual figures aren't in manifesto, I read, so, uh, Labour want to increase spending by six billion, while uh, Conservative said about eight billion. I, again, I don't, those, I don't know about the figures, if someone would like to find figures. Uh, Zoe, what do you think is the main thing that you know NHS needs at the moment to help sort out this crisis? Um, I don't really know because I haven't been paying much attention to this whole stuff. But I think the stuff that you guys are saying about like A and E and stuff—that was a big issue that I saw a lot. That people were saying that people owe almost abuse the NHS like they don't need to be going in for all of these things you could just book an appointment with your doctor but also there was just something I saw junior doctors are being heavily heavily overworked like they're doing like 20 hour shifts so do you think do you think do you think in the sense of them being overworked do you think there's a, a, a sort of like a sort of like a short sort of shortage of them in the sense that they're being heavily overworked do you think there's that you're nodding your head, Sam? Do you think there's a yeah. massive shortage? Yeah, on? there is, and the ones we've got right now are fantastic. Because let's let's go to the Manchester um, attack, which happened recently. We had doctors which weren't even being paid for what they were doing. They turn up in the middle of the night because it happened at what was it half past ten? Half past ten. Turn up to hospitals unpaid, just to help the victims. So we had we had unpaid we had unpaid doctors or people who were being unpaid or not paid for their work they were doing on the night. And they had to turn up to be able to help, or else they would have been short short of staff. Um, so, thank God for that. No, we got them. They're fan fantastic. They really do help us. But yeah, we we need more. In my opinion, so, we need more. So so then again, so you know, let's say let's go further down the line to why there might be uh, a shortage of junior doctors. Do you think you know you know becoming a doctor you know should be pushed more in education? If that's the case, then uh, no, I, it I, is a very very long process to becoming a doctor you have to do a very long course at university you have to be really into it it's, it's, it's something like seven eight years to actually become a fully qualified it's doctor. something you have to be like yeah. fully dedicated for yeah like, like i don't think it's something that you can just sort of be like oh fancy being a doctor it's, it's something that you have to sort of grow yeah. up thinking i want to help people plus being a doctor is a hard job mm -hmm. you have to see so much like pain you have to go through all of this you have to like also tell and also people's personal exactly, stories exactly you have well. to talk to people you have to do all that yeah. it's not a type of job that you can sort of just but go it, into. but it's also like very rewarding in the sense of actually like to be fair like for junior doctors pay isn't great when yeah. but when you become a, like a full a full on full time doctor pay is actually quite decent but that is a very long well, process of, to get there one Sorry. of the problems in the NHS is the fact that there's some doctors who do the same work as everyone else on massive pay slips they have massive pay slips and then there's some other doctors who do the exact same as what the ones with the massive pay slips do, on tiny, tiny pay? They get, t they get just above minimum wage. I think it is. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't really work out. No, how they, that yeah, there's some with like ten times what they get, what the other doctors get, and, and if they do the same job, I think the wages could be sorted out better. And then I, I think, I don't know if we spoke about this, but the when they increase the M the MPs or the members of parliaments. Their pay by ten percent, and then there was that that could have gone that could have gone to towards doctors, because that that's a lot. Ten percent is a big increase in wage, especially for members of parliament. That could have gone towards wages in hospitals, 
um, it could have gone towards funding more um, beds. But, 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 like, for example, quite a lot of, like, so, for example, uh, on, well, actually, funny enough, on Monday, you know, the school did an interview with the Labour representative of Bath and the Conservative one, which happened to be Ben Howlett, and, you know, I asked him personally and said, you know, there's been this, you know, 10% increase in MPs, MPs, you know, pay, do you not think, you know, that shouldn't have really happened? Because MPs, you know, on, on very healthy wages, do you not think, you know, that money should have actually gone towards something else? And then he openly said, you know, he said, like, you know, the extra money I got given, you know, actually I gave it to charities, you know, helping yeah. people. Uh, that, that's good. Cause he, 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 him as a Conservative, it's good that he stood up and disagree, disagreed with what his party did and gave his pay away to charities, which is fantastic of him. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I do believe that 10% should have been put into the NHS. OK, um, so going back to a few statistics here, so we have Bath up, obviously, with, you know, with the Bath Studio School, so we'll have a look at our own constituency. So we have a, uh, so a 74.3 turnout. Uh, Liberal Democrat, uh, we're a hop house with uh, 23,436 votes. That's a 47.3% uh, overall. And then uh, Conservative Ben Howlett, it's uh, 70,742 with a 35.8% lead there. How many percent was... Um was Labour, sorry? Uh, Labour, we're just getting on to that now. Uh, so he only got 7,279 with a 14.7%. That was a letdown, to be honest, because he, he came on Monday talking about all his plans for Labour and, like, all, all he but, saw. Like, but people, people could also say, you know, his, you know, because he, he didn't, like, necessarily, like, having watched that opinion, I felt like it was just, you know, re- yeah. like, reflecting what Jeremy Corbyn has said, and there was nothing, like, when, you know, Ben Howlett came in, he said what he was going to do for the constituency. I felt, you know, the Labour MP just come and said, you know, nationally. Yeah, yeah, like, he didn't say anything new at all. Yeah. So, um, so, and then you have finally the Green Party, Elena Field, uh, 1,125 votes with a 2.3%. Uh, minus nine, and actually this is, you know, so we'll have a look at the swings here as well, actually. Uh, Liberal Democrat, a 17.6% swing there. Uh, Green Party, uh, minus 9.7% swing there. Conservative, uh, minus 2.0% lead. And Labour actually an increase with uh, 1.5% uh, swing there. Um, so, you know, you know, going back to, you know, deciding what our coalition might be, uh, Zoe, has there, what kind of reactions has there been on Twitter just about everything in general? Well, there was quite a few uh, funny tweets about the uh, hung parliament. I'm just going to try and get them up quickly. <laughs> Um, well, in the meantime, while Zoe does that, I actually found this uh, rather interesting graph. I don't know if it's a bit of a joke, to be honest. Um, but it said, uh, the Labour slash Conservative cycle said, people blame the Tories, but Labour are responsible with money and debt when empowered. By the way, this isn't official anywhere. This is just, you know, something I found online that, you know, my proper press probably been posted by a Conservative leader, yeah. uh, not leader, uh, voter. It said, uh, the result is that Labour is never trusted under difficult circumstances and uh, the Conservatives never allowed to govern for having to make any hard decisions to save the economy. Uh, so that's so it's like a massive diagram of a circle with three points. So it's a Labour Party tax spends too much and ruins the economy. Do you think uh, that is kind of a reflection of what Jeremy Corden said about his spending plans on tuition fees? You know, increasing all this spending everywhere else, where you know, you know, spending too much and you know, taxes, you know, necessarily going through the roof, like in corporation tax, for example. Do you do you think do you think that first part of the cycle was true? Um, there's an element of truth to it because. The last time Labour were actually in, they ended up putting us in quite a bit of debt, and the Conservatives came in and they got rid of that debt at that time. But I read somewhere when the Conservatives came in and sorted out, um, who was it? David Cameron was it? That's yeah. Right. Um, they they were cut it. They were cutting um, different things in different places, and I read that I read somewhere which I can, I, can, I can't tell you where I read this, but um, that the cuts which he made a lot of them were unnecessary and he could have done it in much better places which could have benefited our country more but he made some drastic cuts in places which could have not actually been cut okay uh so then the next part of the cycle is conservatives pick up the pieces and bring the economy back under control again and then the third then the third part of the cycle says Conter- country suffers memory loss and votes for labor in anti-austerity protests mm. do you think that graph is an accurate representation obviously it's not official anywhere you know no media outlet has published this it's just you know someone that's put online do you think this you know kind of might be a bit of a reality report as i was just saying i think I think there's slight flaws in that. There's a few things that I missed out. Okay. A few things that I missed out with that um, 
graph, like I said, um, the things which didn't have to be cut, so that a few unnecessary cuts made, and maybe, and that was a different Labour at the time. They had obviously had a few. Quite well, a few obviously, members. you know, Tony Blair, you know, coming in and um, in what was it, 1997, with you know a massive, you know, over 400 seat majority. Yeah. You know, and obviously declining, you know, over the years. Um, so. If, you know, having a look now as we will have a we'll have a look more. You know, film. So, uh, so well, looking at this graphic, you know, conservatives, you know, painfully close to the line. Do you think, you know, Luis? Do you think Theresa May, you know, is a bit gutted? You know, as, as these results came in, you well, know, not really. What obviously not should, what she hoped for. Should be. I mean, being six, seven seats away from gaining the majority, and should but, be should be gutted to be honest. But but do you think you know? Do you think you know? So looking at that, it actually looks like so Lib Dem in the in, in the last election, only eight seats have come back with twelve. You know, Conservatives only a few seats off their Labour and getting a few of what were Conservative, you know, like yeah. Conservative strongholds. You know, like we said about Canterbury at the beginning. You know, first time it's ever gone Labour. Do you think you know, like Lib Dem, Lib Dem's like like quite a big comeback compared to the last election. Mm. Do you think has like you know lost a few of Conservatives? Well, obviously it has. Has lost yeah. seats there for the yeah. Conservatives. Yeah, they have, and she should be really gutted about that. That's like her main, but probably the, the main regret about her. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Do, uh, Louise, do you reckon? Do you reckon it's Theresa May's fault for her campaigning, or do you, re- do you reckon there was something she could have fixed up in her campaign? Where do you reckon they lost? Well, maybe lost maybe turning up to at least a bit one or two more debates than. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually turn up Maybe to answering some questions, cool. like I was one question in, in question time a few weeks ago, and like she was avoiding questions. Like, yeah. I mean, but Jeremy Corbyn's also been doing the same. Yeah, you know? the, Pe- people asked him, you know, I mean, well, what what are your what's your stance on you know Trident, and he you know, kind I of th- avoided the question. I think that's like the standard politician. Like you have to avoid questions as a politician. That's like your first rule. Like avoid questions, <laughs> and yeah, avoid then, questions at all costs. Even though you know, it's not yeah, actually yeah. an official rule. Yeah. So, so do you, I, I'll ask you. I want to ask you a question. When when Jeremy Corbyn he was planning to come to Bristol, he was, he was planning to come to Bristol to do a talk in the NHS rally, which was planned. But then about an hour, two hours before um, this big debate, he said. Uh, in Cambridge, he said, "I'm, I'm, I'm now going to this debate. I'm not going to turn. I'm not going to be at Bristol." Do you reckon that was something that he just did spur of the moment, or do you reckon he planned to do that? I reckon, I reckon he'd been planning to do that, you know, you know, and going on live TV and like, you know, Theresa May, you know, you're too scared, you know, to come and come, come here and you know, debate against me. When actually, like, Theresa May might have actually thought, you know, like. At the end of the day, she is Prime Minister. She was doing this election, you know, this campaign, this election, yeah. as well as running the country and yeah. starting to swing out Brexit negotiations, you know, having to do with other political things, you know, about Donald Trump here and there. And yeah. she, she could have done the easy thing, which was stay in her comfy chair, not call any election. You know, have a pe- have quite a lot of people unfair. And actually, yeah. I do have a lot of respect, even though, you know, she hasn't come out the way she wanted. She, you know, she has my respect in the fact of, you know, let people decide who yeah. they want in. And they still have got her, but it's, again, again, who she goes with. And does, she, you know, the DUP are referred to as, you know, the Irish Tories, and it could most likely be them. You know, Lib Dem said, at this, you know, said throughout this election, you know, we're not going to coalition, but everyone thought this election, Conservative will count with an 80 seat majority, and coalition was at a hung parliament. It was only a very, very small probability that might happen. And obviously, now it's a massive bit of ability because we have got a hung parliament. So, do you definitely think it's going to be a Conservative coalition, not a. Um uh, with the Labour, the, min- the minority. Yeah, definitely, because you know, like like I just said, you know, the, the Irish. Well, they're referred to as the Irish Tories. Um, you know, they've got ten seats. You know, that will just push it over the mark for uh, three hundred and twenty-seven. Uh, do you, Do you think? Like I, I just I think I don't think Labour can form a minority government. You know, Conservatives do have the most seats, and you know, cons- like look, look there. Okay, so three hundred and eighteen seats so far, two hundred and sixty-one. You know, Labour can form a minority government, but won't get anything through. Well, they've surprised us by getting this amount of. They they have surprised seats. us by getting this amount. So but, you never know what they could but, do. <laughs> yeah, but they can't they can't get anything through. You know, the whole point of ha- so so the whole point of having majority. You know, so three hundred twenty-five is exactly half. Three hundred twenty-six having the majority. You know, to pass bills through. 
you know, Labour will not be able to pass anything through. Yeah, they could go into coalition with SNP, but that, you know, that doesn't, that gets them, you know, a few seats off the 300 mark. That's, that's not going to be But do you reckon the prospect of Labour asking each one of the other smaller parties and the smaller parties actually be able to get a seat? Or get main, well, main so so the biggest party, you know, after Labour and Conservative is SNP, and you know, and they've got what, you know, so you're looking at 30, 35, 35 mm-hmm. seats. And that takes it up to you know just short of a hundred, three hundred. But then you've got to add on, you know, Lib Dem, you know, twelve seats. That's only three hundred twelve, and then uh, Green Party, another one, DUP. Uh, they will literally need. Uh, yeah. The rest of the parties, like a conservative minority, you know, sorry, a Labour, excuse me, uh, a Labour minority government, is only like a, a little, like a little probability if all else fails that Conservative, you know, can't actually form a coalition government. Yeah. Which, to be honest, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure Theresa May has already been on the phone to, um, you know, the uh, Lib Dem, you know, leader, and spoken and said, you know, what, what do you think? You got your thoughts on this? Because you, people always change their opinion when they're put down to it. Yeah. Especially when, when the um, temptation for actually being back in power is there. I'm, I'm sure they might. You know, and he might, he might, you know, and I'm, I think Nick Clegg, you know, said throughout the 2010, you know, 2010 like, elections that, you know, no, we, will, we won't go into coalition, but put down to it and the possibility being there, he might turn around and be like, but then you have got, you know, the the Irish parties might just come in and be like, no, let's just make this a bit, the, sorry, the Northern Irish parties might come in and say, you know, let's just make this a, e- a bit easier and just get on with it. A lot of people dislike Nick Clegg, but do you reckon it's a fair judgment of them to dislike him, or do you reckon he did good whilst he was in with the Tories? Because a lot of people don't like what the Tories did whilst they were in coalition. I think, I think generally Nick Clegg is, you know, a, quite an amazing, like, not necessarily amazing, but a very good in the poli- in a politician in the sense of he kind of was kind of direct he wasn't he wasn't outlandish he wasn't extreme he wasn't you know extreme left wing or extreme right wing so you have to remember Lib Dem tends to be a party you know, in the middle and yeah. would sway side to side sometimes and he kind of like he was put, you know David Cameron in that 2010 election was put under very difficult circumstances and I felt like Nick Clegg you know kind of I feel like if Theresa May does ask you know Lib Dem you know let's form a coalition government I don't think Lib Dem would decline it yeah. because they they, ha- they haven't been put in that position and they probably haven't really thought about that position because you know polls have said you know Tories were going to get an 80 seat plus majority I thought when when they um, put out their manifesto I thought the Lib Dems were dead and gone I, I didn't think many people would many people would vote for it but they completely um, they completely proved me wrong there by getting how many more seats was it than last year five five more seats uh, Lib Dem yeah uh, well, last election, yeah, uh, got eight seats, yeah. so plus four seats. Up. I didn't think they'd get many seats because of their manifesto, but they've one hundred percent proved me wrong now. Yeah, um, news just in actually uh, May. Uh, so official word says uh, May signals her intention to carry on despite losing her majority. While Jeremy Corbyn says he is ready to serve. Uh, Louise, well, what is your reaction on you know Jeremy Corbyn turning around and saying I'm ready to serve? What do you think Jeremy Corbyn is trying to imply? Well. There? He's saying, if she resigns, I'm here. If, I don't know, it could have many, many meanings. It's Jeremy Corbyn. Do, 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 do you think Jeremy Corbyn is, you know, implying that, you know, if all else fails with a conservative, you know, coalition, that his party is there ready to serve with maybe maybe an SNP coalition yeah, there, not maybe. not not the you know not even you know not hasn't got the biggest party in the house there, but do have quite a big political impact in the sense of you know compared to the conservatives, yeah. conservative governments who you know are coming up what just over six, you know, sixty seats above them really, and sixty six is also a lot a lot of seats really. Uh, now, what do you what do you think in the sense of you know certain leaders having to resign? Do you think? Uh, Nicholas Sturgeon should resign. Do you think Jeremy Corbyn should resign? Who, I don't what think do you think in the sense of resignations? By in terms of resignation, I don't think they should unless there's like a, a strong mass demand for them to resign. I feel like if there's not that, there's no reason for them to actually resign. Yeah, I've, I've just I got up here on Twitter that uh, there's quite a lot of like kind of firsts in terms of the election. For example, there's been more than two hundred female MPs elected. Labour has gained two disabled MPs. Um, in Battersea and uh, Sheffield Hallam. The first female Sikh MP has been elected in um, Birmingham. Uh, many others, just quite a lot of just firsts. That's why it could sound out. 
Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, now, obviously, you know, just waiting on, you know, con you know, reaction from all the parties, you know, waiting for certain leaders to do their speeches. You know, we're not, re we don't, we don't really have a set time on what leaders are going to do their speeches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, do you reckon uh, Jeremy Corbyn's waiting on a reaction from Theresa May on what she decides to do? Or do you think Theresa May is in discussions at the moment with, you know, you know, Northern Irish parties to see if she can form a coalition with them? He very, she, very, she very well could be. Uh, this morning I was watching, I think it was, I was watching what was happening on the news. And she went, she, they were all waiting at the front of the number 10 to see what she does, see when she goes in to number 10. But as she went through the back door, so they had no idea what she was doing. And, they, and she, she came out the front, so she could have well be doing that straight away before the before the election. Do you reckon? Fact, the obviously, oh, yeah, obviously, we can't sit here and speculate. You know what parties do on the inside, but do you think you know a few weeks ago she might have you know start, like started speaking to certain you know smaller parties and saying you know if worse comes to us, can we please form a coalition? Do, do you think do you think she would have prepared herself like that, or do you think you know she was a bit arrogant in the sense of you know she thought she would have a clean sweep majority? I can't speak for her, <laughs> but. I, I, I don't know if she do you reckon she was arrogant in the first place to call the entire thing or do you reckon you no know, I, I don't I don't think she was arrogant at all I, I think you know which, which she did it with full intent of you know the country you know having a democratic yeah. having a democratic, democratic either. Yeah, yeah and deciding who they actually want to lead Brexit because you know we'll come back to it again Brexit is the only reason we are having this and so, uh, so we have uh, 648 out of 656 decided. Only wait on oh, two more. Um, the the Corm, Cornwall ones have been um, voted because there was two main ones in Cornwall which hadn't been decided. And I think the mid, almost all of Cornwall is, has voted Conservative, which is... Which is no change there, really. Even. Yeah. Well, they, well, apart from, I believe, Plymouth, actually. Yeah, Plymouth, um, Plymouth, Plymouth is Devon. Um, yeah, they they vote they voted lab they voted Labour. So if we have a quick look at Plymouth, and you know Plymouth, you know has been a you know Labour, uh, sorry a Conservative. Uh, if we have a look at this one here, uh, Plymouth, Sutton, and Devonport has gone Labour. Yeah. So uh, so in Plymouth and Sutton and Devonport, so Labour have uh, twenty three thousand eight hundred and eight votes with a fifty three point four percent lead. Now, a plus sixteen point seven percent, which is, again is a massive swing there. So again, one of like kind of the only constituencies in you know in the southwest choosing Labour via Bristol, which is obviously a big city, which was kind of I think predicted bound to go Labour, even with the last election as well. You know, voted to go Labour. Uh, now, do you think you know quite a lot of people have to change their political opinion based on you know the last election with in what's terms happened? Of Bristol or Bath? Uh, just like generally in the southwest. I feel like they most likely have, compared to the last election. I feel like a lot of them have changed it all. I know, I know of quite a few people in Bath particularly who, as they knew that it was extremely hard to near impossible for Labour to get in, because so many little people voting for Labour, quite a lot of people have voted Lib Dem as quite a, a gamble kind of strategic vote, just to kind of prevent... But, kind of but the thing is, you know, people, you know, people have said, you know, a Lib Dem strategic vote, you know, to get get the Tories out. But we don't know. It could be, you know, a possibility yeah. that Lib Dem do form a coalition government with the Tories. In which it could work negatively against... Which them. backlashes on everyone like who was like, like, you know, a, let's strategic vote. I feel like quite a lot of people who have done that have just pretty much... They've not put a lot of, like, a lot of kind of thought to the future for it. They've pretty much just thought, but, but, if I do this, it's not true. But then if it does work in work in the right way for them, it was a, it was a big decision to choose because... It's yes, a massive get, 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 but getting Lib Dem in instead of, in Bath instead of um, cons getting Conservative in, that's yeah. taken one of their seats away. And how many? How far away from were they from the majority vote? Uh, it was seven seats, wasn't it? Yeah. So that that that's a big one seat. For Bath, Bath is a big well, seat for for them to not get. Well, uh, for the Lib Liberal Democrats to win. Yeah, at the moment, so seats stand at three hundred eighteen for Conservatives. So again, you know, just fractionally off there. Yeah. A majority government, you know, and so the people, the people strategically voting, in, in fact, have, have, well, they've done their job really. But, but, with, but with Bath, it's it's a one of those, however many, however many, um, conservative needed. Yeah. The, the one strategic vote, at the moment, is worked yeah. for the people who wanted to vote, who wanted to vote Labour. Yeah. But um, for the people who, but for the, for, but if it ends up being conservative Lib Dem, which, me personally, I can't see happening, it will then work against them. 
Okay, so do you think, you know, strategic voting, so do so you think overall, you know, if Lib Dem, you know, do to decide to go into a coalition mm -hmm. with the Conservative Party, do you think that has actually worked out? Not, not if they go into a, if they go into a coalition with um, the Conservatives, it's not worked out for them. But it's do, you, do you think it's a possibility Lib Dems could, do you know, decide? Because you know they haven't actually been put in the position. Do you think it is a possibility they could? Yeah, it is a possibility because once once Lib Dems get their sights on power or a slight bit of power, then they probably will swing their vote. Then, then I was saying that then uh, how it might work negatively because then Conservative could still be in. But they could then say that the, the Liberal Democrats could be holding the Conservatives back from a lot of the changes that they wanted to make, which they didn't agree with in the first place. So it could still work out perfectly but fine for them, or better than they would have, would have got if they voted Labour. Yeah. OK, so on a, obviously, you know, the time sh we've just gone past uh, 10 o'clock, still no sign of Theresa May coming out and giving a verdict. You don't know, I reckon it's taking a lot of time more than usual because, you know, obviously, you know, Theresa May might be on the phone to you know god don't know god knows who and you know please form a coalition government with me and all else fails you know it might turn out that labor do form a minority government which wouldn't really work in their favor because well all conservative could form a minority government i would say i would say it would surprise me if they formed a minority one but they've already surprised me again how much how much they've got which is brilliant for them but you know i think i think the i think we've kind of seen like a slow increase so when you know you know polls first opened when the snap election was announced you know can you know labor like massively behind you know conservative in polls but then have got a massive surge and a massive increase you know just being a few points off as poll like like um prediction polls you know yesterday like i think like looking at prediction polls yesterday i remember well i've got one up here on my ipad and you know i think it was literally like a frack it was like less than three points off which is you know absolutely amazing for you know which for at him. the start they were like 25 30 points off weren't they yeah so uh so actually you know predictions here you know this is now cast one of you know one of the top you know predictions uh said that labor would only get 219 seats you know sat here you know 261 it goes to show you like even with brexit even with the american elections that you know prediction polls mean nothing now and you know, over the last few years, we've you know, like over, there was a few years where you know they, they were really, really proved, but they're not really anymore, are they? Um, going back to the young voters, eighteen to twenty-four, I have some stats. In the tw two thousand one, two thousand five, two thousand ten, and two thousand fifteen election, the turnout was around four percent. In this election, it was seventy-two percent, and many people are thanking, in a way. Labour for for um, inspiring young people to go and vote. I think is this election has had everything to be honest in terms of it's got like everyone involved because yeah. like a few years back, I mean, not many people cared about politics or didn't know much about it. But now I see more people more interested. I mean, myself, <laughs> if you. If you had to ask me about politics two years, three years ago, I wouldn't be able to answer any questions about politics. But now I obviously gained more interest, uh, more interest, and I think that's that's a really well done to obviously Labour, Conservative, and trying to get more young people to vote. Uh, without that, how many? What did you say the percentage increase was? How many more than last More time? than thirty percent. More than thirty percent. If without those thirty percent, I think Conservative would have won. Do you think, though, in the sense of, you know, hearing, like, a lot of, you know, from, like, I've had, like, you know, I've been speaking to, like, my family members and, like, just general people at, like, where I work and stuff, and, you know, a lot of them have turned around and said, like, I don't feel like young young people, you know, haven't lived in the world, they haven't, you know, paid much taxes, they haven't, you know, experienced the stuff we have over the years, and, you know, the economic crash that, put it bluntly, Labour did cause under Blair and uh, Brown governments, so... I think I think so. I think Jeremy Corbyn's tactics has been, you know, get the get the young people voting, which actually is a, a it's, really it's a good really thing, good thing, yeah. thing, but not but necessarily a bad thing in the sense of you know young people might just be seeing you know free stuff here, free stuff there, rather than actually you know looking at a few years down the line, it may affect our economy massively, but no one knows until it's actually done. Yeah. But the people who vote, if younger people, those are the people who in a couple of years it's going to affect the most. 
So I think if young people are voting, that means they're finally taking a grasp on their future and the future of this country, which hasn't happened before. They haven't been interested in everything and a lot of people have been tweeting on Facebook and you see it everywhere now. A lot of young people are getting involved. I think last year's referendum had a lot to do with this turnout, I think. That do you think? So yeah. do you think, you know, yeah. there's a lot of... So, so for example, you have two, you know, polar opposites, Labour pushing for a soft Brexit and Theresa May wanting to go in, thrash the whip with a really hard Brexit. Uh, pictures just coming in now, actually, obviously, we can't show you, uh, but Theresa May has left uh, Conservative headquarters and looks like she is on her way to so Downing nice Street. Well, she is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at the moment. Maybe subject to change, though, and we'll know in a few hours. You are here on the Bar Studio School YouTube channel on a night of controversy and surprise with a hung parliament being impressive for Conservatives just becoming a few seats short of a majority. Obviously not what the polls decided, but obviously Theresa May, you know, worrying, maybe worrying, Frank, you know, a lot at the moment about who is she going to form a coalition with, you know, after, you know, Lib Dem saying we will not go into coalition with you and Theresa May possibly having to look further afield to Northern Irish parties. Now, let's move on to uh, some more statistics from the last election. So, obviously, you know, the last election, 2015, David Cameron in charge, you know, versus Ed Miliband of the Labour Party. Conservative overall getting uh, 11 million. 300, uh, so 334,576 votes. Uh, well, Labour suffering, you know, quite big in the sense of, you know, compared to this election, 9,347,304 votes. Uh, up 1.5%, though, on the 2010 election, well, Tory were only up 0.8. So, you know, you could look at those statistics and say, you know, Labour have been on the rise over the last few years and actually, you know, suffered, you know, quite a lot of losses in the 2010 election. Obviously, but you know, conservative not gaining enough for you know for them to sweep in and take it. With Just figures like that, um, let, let's say the 11 million and then the 9 million, if it depend depending on what constituencies in Labour, they, they, what, what constituencies those votes are in, Labour could have well well won that with two million less votes. So um, I, I don't believe in the current voting system we've got. I think it's an unfair and doesn't it's not actually representative of everyone. Um, not, this isn't just because of my own views, but this is just because I don't believe that it works. Even if the um, po the group I don't the po po political party I don't support gets in, I just don't think it actually represents what people will believe. Uh, do, do you share the same opinion with me? Yeah, I just I I feel like. I feel like so every like you know there's been surprises you know throughout this you know the exit poll last night saying you know Tories will come short of a majority and you know Labour coming in and actually getting a massive surge you know which actually was not expected from the start of the snap election call you know when the snap election was called you know Theresa May was saying tactically you know Jeremy Corbyn's very low in the polls at the moment and suddenly Jeremy Corbyn cut this massive drive driving young voters you know driving what the public may necessarily want to hear but you know, a lot of, you know, Theresa May may disagree and say, you know, what, not what the country needs. Yeah. Uh, I just have a quick another question. Do you believe, do, do you think the current voting system we've got is an actual good rep, rep, there's, representation of well, what people want? Well, there's been, like, uh, loads of controversy, obviously, around this. And, you know, it was, I, I knew that it was obviously going to be questioned, you know, after the results from tonight. There's, it's really hard to do it because, you know, the whole point of Parliament is, you know, the you know the government is formed by whoever the people vote in local constituencies you know anyone can stand for a party theoretically in a local constituency and you know be a, be elected and you know represent a certain party and you know the whole point is so the majority is there you know you know that that magical fi figure of 326 you know that magic number every party wants to get is very important because like just so just having 326 you know you have got you have got the majority of that even though it's by one person you have got the majority of the house to push to push your bills through and stuff and it's very hard to change you know people have suggested why not have two options on the ballot paper have prime ministers that aren't necessarily with a party and you know you select your local representative but you know again that, it turns it's very hard to change if what, what what let's go around the table sam what would you do what do you think what would you change if you could you know there the, was um proposed a while ago i I don't know the exact year, but there was a um, vote between people about this new polling system. It was, um, it was, it was, it was. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's where you give your first choice, your second choice, and your third choice, um, and then it gives you, and then it gives you the second option. I, I can't explain how it works. 
um, but but uh, it was a lot more representative, and the the media for some reason was slam it, slamming that idea quite a bit and put, putting the idea down. I believe if we had that actually in, it, we actually had that idea in check, then we then we would have a lot more of a representative, um, a lot more of representative figures and a, an actual representative government. And I I try and campaign for put if if I if I was in a position of let's say Jeremy Corbyn or Theresa May, I would want to try and get that in Parliament again. Okay. Um, so obviously, you know, like like we've spoken about, you know, a huge shock and you know, I think I think the exit poll so I was there watching, you know, obviously last night the exit poll came in on on BBC, you know, and saying, you know, conservative you know, the first thing that flashes up is Conservative will be the biggest party and then a few moments later it come up with, you know, predicted, you know, only three hundred and sixteen. Obviously conservatives have now passed that with you know, so obviously the the exit poll changes overnight. Now the forecast is three hundred and nineteen conservatives are on three hundred and eighteen. Uh, with only, if I just double check, one seat left to go. Um, so it mostly looks like Conservatives, you know, will get, you know, what the forecast says and actually, you know, goes to show the whole algorithm of, you know, exit poll actually does work, even though, you know, people may not have agreed with it, but it does go to show it does work. Do you, do you think, Luis? It works, in my opinion. I mean, shouldn't change what works. That's my view. I mean, many people. Obviously, you can't get everyone happy, but it, it does work. But do you? But do you believe that? Um, that I think it was last in the last election. Uh, I'm going to get these figures a bit wrong here, but I think it was UKIP got one million votes, but they got one seat, whereas Liberal Democrats got a, a couple of hundred thousand, and they got seven seats. Was it seven seats last election or was it eight? Eight. Uh, eight. eight. Yeah. They got eight seats. So is that fair? I mean. But then again, it's, it's also a difficult one because, you know, you want a government, you know, the whole point of having a democratic government is you want the people, you know, you want the government of the majority of people have decided to vote, hence why Theresa May will probably end up running a hung parliament, you know, as much as people don't like it, but that's what people have voted at the end of the day. Yeah, it's just my, my point here is that the, the, the Liberal Democrats last last year would have ended up with a lot more voice actually in parliament because first you get, you obviously get more people, more voice in the actual Houses of Parliament. But with UKIP, they got they got over, they got over a million votes, a lot a lot more than more votes than the Liberal Democrats. But they got one seat, whereas the Liberal Democrats got a lot less than UKIP. I think it, I think it was Liberal Democrats. Well, yeah, um, and then they got more of a voice. Well, well, yeah. Looking looking at your point here, actually, uh, so statistics here said you know you know UKIP with one point eight percent and Green with one point six percent, but yet Green are the one who have the one MP with. Yep. You know, UKIP have none, so I do understand your point, but it's, then it's very hard to change about how it works. It is hard to change, and I said this earlier, there was a, um, a different voting a different voting system which was uh, proposed a while ago, and the media slammed it a lot, which got people not actually wanting it, so I think it was 60% of people voted for not, not to introduce it. And it, 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 in my opinion, it was a good voting system. You'd have to research it, because I don't have the actual... Um, I don't have... For you, how how it would work, but it was a lot more representative of what people actually thought. Well, as you said, um, the media. You said earlier, mm -hmm. um, the media, the slamming it. Like the media has a lot of influence. It does have a lot of influence. So, so do you, do you reckon it's um, the, with the media? Do you reckon it's right that, let's say, there's a lot of newspapers who are very much conservative in this election? Did you reckon that was right? I mean, correct I, I, don't think, I don't think it's correct to have. I mean, you can have a view, yeah, as a newspaper, but like, so, so you, you still have to be like a bit neutral, I yes, guess. So, so you don't reckon it's so you don't reckon it's right to actually push push the editor's opinions on onto the public. You reckon no. it should be neutral. It should be like you can, yeah, show you your view, like oh yeah, this and that, but. Up to a limit, yeah. Like, not extreme. Like, so, so you reckon they are allowed? You should, you should actually. They should be allowed to slightly push their, um, push, push their opinions on the public, but it shouldn't. But but they shouldn't do it too much. Like like in the Sun yesterday, they had a picture of Jeremy Corbyn in a bin. Like uh, that's yeah. just. Extreme, but, extreme. but I, I was reading a thing actually, you know, that actually quite a lot of, you know, news companies are run by, you know, quite quite wealthy billionaires that tend to vote conservative and they, they know for a fact that, you know, their their views will have 
a lot of impact in the sense of, you know, so for example, you know, people who have seen that and thought, oh, Corbyn, you know, Bin Corbyn, yeah, you know, yeah. get him out and, you know, may have actually turned around and said um, that actually, you know, do have a lot of influence. And yeah, it is biased, don't get me wrong, you know, it is biased and it shouldn't be allowed, but at the end of the day, it's happening. But like we've seen tonight, you know, it hasn't been proved, you know, you yeah. know, people, more and more people are coming understanding, you know, that the media does tend to be biased. Do you reckon if the media wasn't biased, there'd be a more of a Labour vote, more people voting Labour? Or Oof. do you reckon it would stay the same? I reckon, I reckon, actually, I actually, I reckon it would be in the Conservatives' favours in the fact, you know, a lot of people saw that and actually got frustrated by it and thought it was immature and actually, you know, might, you know, quite a lot of people do get angry by newspapers such as the such as the Sun, the Sun, and oh. just and just thought, nah, like it's yeah. really, really unfair, actually. So with your with your view there, which I've just listened to, and I actually agree with. I wasn't really thinking of that before. I reckon they may, might balanced out, and this might just be a general representative without any influence at all. Maybe there's people here voting out of frustration, and there's people voting out of being influenced by the media, so that so. That they then so the people frustrated then don't vote conservative and the people who are influenced vote conservative and it works out do you reckon it could just i don't know i just i i'm just like i think everything you know up in the air you know i think the whole country is in a bit of confusion by what's actually happening because there's all these like you know labor minority government conservative you know not being able to when you know you you look at the basics and you know, I think, I think also, I think a lot of, you know, Labour people, you know, that are hearing because, you know, people wanted this, you know, like, uh, election to be about stability, and, you know, the, con you know, the Conservatives, you know, um, you know, slogan for most of it being strong and stable haven't exactly proven that tonight. <laughs> and I think, I think a lot of people, you know, about this, Theresa May, you know, may, um, may, you know, decide... Oh yeah, I'm gonna stay because you know people are kind of fed up with all this unrest. You know, the Scottish referendum 2015, you know, election in 2015, you know, some sort of stability. You know, David Cameron then announced this election in 2000, you know, referendum in 2016, and then Theresa May, you know, come out and said, you know, we're not going to do a snap election, we're not going to snap election, then no, election. This is going to be the people that see it through, and then you know, deciding at the end of the day, actually, no, well, we we are going to, you know, we're going to have a snap election, and it hasn't worked in her favour, but I can see why she's done it, and I just. I feel like she sometimes, you know, she sometimes get, gets a bit of slack when, and actually looking at this, I can see why she wanted to do it. Yep. It hasn't worked in her favour, no, but wouldn't, wouldn't you rather, you know, she sat here, you know, this is how we're going to do Brexit, you know, you haven't elected me, this is how we're going to do Brexit. And, you know, a lot of people may have, you know, turned around and be like, well, actually, no. So I think she has done the right thing and, you know, it called this election. Yeah. No, I, 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 I do believe that as well. I think it's a good thing that she actually went out and, and gave the people the choice of who's leading us, leading us um, out of the European Union. Because that, that's what it's really about, this election. Who's going to be leading us out of the European Union? Not, it wasn't really mainly about any other... Any other well, it was, it was, obviously, it's about who's leading our country. But I think the main thing she called this for is that, that, that the actual people could choose what politician is leading us out of Europe. Yeah. Um, uh, breaking news, uh, Justin, sorry to cut you short there, Sam. No uh, breaking news, Justin, uh, it is reported Theresa May will visit Buckingham Palace at 12.30 to seek permission to form a UK government despite losing her commons majority. Uh, that's all we have at the moment. Um, uh, so the DUP chairman has said we will work in best interest of Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Um, and it's with, she hasn't, hasn't officially said, but she think by looking at this, it looks like Theresa May has got full support of the uh, DUP party. DUP, DUP party, obviously being the Democratic Unionist Party based in Northern Ireland, have won 10 seats. Uh, Conservatives obviously falling just short there with uh, 318 seats. Obviously, the D getting the DUP on a coalition will push that to uh, 328, which means Conservatives will hold overall majority, but it will be a hung parliament. Um, so obviously quite a lot of uncertainty, but obviously these are just speculations and these are rumours, but it looks like Theresa May has got her coalition sorted and is going to ask, you know, Her Majesty the Queen for opinions to, you know, you know, not, sorry, not opinion, but permission, because obviously she has to, uh, to start a new government. Uh, what, what, what's everyone's reactions to this? Expected. Expected? And do you think, you know, she's tried to work as fast as she can to get this done, Zoe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, do you think, you know, like, you know, and especially as well, I reckon, like, a f you know, I reckon maybe a few weeks back when she called the snap election, you know, if, you know, worse comes to worse with this, I do have, you know, if worse comes to worse and probably try to sort out some kind of deal with 
DUP, you know, if, you know, if, if worse comes to worse, and she did have a coalition a government, so obviously uh, that an ongoing story. Obviously, we you know we won't be here when she does uh, visit uh, there. But again, an interesting government. And by the looks of things, it looks like Theresa May is well. She is the largest party. The Conservatives are the largest party, uh, and look like uh, for now that they are going to uh, perform a coalition government with the DUP party, which is actually very interesting. Obviously, a Northern Irish-based party. Um, we don't we don't really know much about them. I'm not going to lie. I haven't really you know because it's quite unexpected. You know, I. Come and I come in here, you know, having listened to, you know, I planned this, you know, looking at prediction polls of Conservative, you know, sweeping with a massive majority, but obviously, you know, not getting that. But I, I obviously haven't, you know, haven't really heard much about them. I, th I think we should, you know, be, I think, I think they're open to proposition. And maybe, maybe a lot of parties, you know, would be happy. I think maybe the DUP especially might be happy with a coalition because it might mean their voice gets heard. Yeah, because I've not actually heard much about the DUP before. Well, yes, but, e but even if, like, Lib Dem, for example, you know, formed a, you know, majority, sorry, a, minor, uh, sorry, a coalition government, you know, they might have actually, you know, got their, you know, because, you know, uh, Lib Dems, you know, strive for a lot of and have, one, have a lot in their manifesto, you know, legalising weed, for example. Um, so I think, I think, you know, a lot of people have turned around and been like, let's, Oh, I've lost my words. <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of people have you know turned around and said you know like maybe you know maybe a coalition could be a good thing because you're having two parties there, possibly. Yeah. Um, okay, so obviously you know uh, speculation uh, there. That's obviously an ongoing story. Uh, Luis, do you have anything else on how this may impact you know general things in the country like? Uh, well, like taxes in like the education system or the NHS or maybe even sport, for example. Is there anything there, you know, how this may affect, you know, the rest of the country at all? Well, sports, I can tell you, Jeremy Corbyn wanted to get 5% of uh, the income of like the biggest football clubs in the country. A lot um, of Jeremy Corbyn's interests were in football. There was, yeah. there was, I saw a graph, um, I don't know if you saw it, but it was showing what Jeremy Corbyn or what Labour would do for for um, football in general, and there was a, there was, I think there was four different policies in there compared to. Is um, that's other that's only that's the thing I I supported him, like it was really good because he, he was playing and getting five percent of every club. Yeah, it was obviously five. every club with like a decent income, yeah. and like the like spend it on like making new football pitches. Yeah, promoting more five percent of I think it was TV rights. TV, yeah, TV rights. That's the one. Putting it into grassroots football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, I haven't. That that's really good. If you take money out of football clubs to do good things, is mm. I support it. I fully support that. Yep. And he's been talking with the Copa ninety guys. Big Arsenal fan. Shame. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, been good. So, so do you think you know a, a leader's certain, you know, a leader of a particular parties, you know, their certain position on, you know, for example, football, for example, could actually have a massive impact on whether that community, you know, you know, tries to, you know, wants yeah. them to be in power. Definitely, or not? Mm. definitely, definitely. Yeah. Because um, in foot in in, well, let's say football for example, because this is what we're using. Foot, there's in, in England because it's our national sport. There's a massive interest in it. We could also say rugby. Rug, there's a massive interest in rugby in England as well. Um, and cricket. And, and cricket. But I think a lot more, I think politicians should put a lot more focus into actual sport. Yeah. Because well, if, if a lot of people focused on sport, I think you said this, um, a lot more people would probably look at that party. That's because it's something that could affect them. For, yeah. for example, me, um, I, I, I quite like things like, I, I, like su I like Sunday League, I like all of our grassroots football. So when Jeremy Corbyn said that he'd put 5% of TV rights from Premier League football, into grassroots into grassroot football, it was it rang alarm bells. But and, like you need like, what you see like, uh, political parties need to promote like not just like football take money off TV rights and make this and that. Like they need to actually promote sports like in school in your spare time because we we are getting like each year we get figures like oh yeah more kids are getting obese are getting fatter and stuff and if you promote sports in schools and P lessons instead of having kids like saying oh I don't have my kit like just to get out of it and not do anything 
or um, in PE. Like, you need to actually promote sport in schools everywhere. Like, uh, I think with um with with this as well, I think they need to not too not too much, but they're starting to shy away from competitiveness in sport. I think competitiveness can be a good thing because it can lead to um, yeah. more, let's say, life skills as well in 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 future in your future life, your career. And, and but peop- the, the government and other schools are starting to shy away from it, try and make it as li- but, literally competitive. But as maybe, maybe the problem is, you know, you know, this, you know, this election has been more ne- not necessarily about, you know, like welfare issues. Well, not not in the sense. So it hasn't been like about massive social issues going on. It's been no. more about national issues going yeah. on. You know, like the NHS, you know, being in crisis, Brexit, yeah, yeah. and you know. Education, you, yeah. And this election has actually been like a campaigning from actually, most parties that's been described as dirty. Do you think, you know, there has been, you know, dirty campaigning, Zoe? From, you know, every party, not just one particular party, but most of the parties, do you think there's been dirty campaigning? Maybe a little bit from every single party, because no, no politician is completely clean, you know, they all sort of a bit... Well, I mean, Theresa May, you know, she said, you know, the naughtiest thing she's done is run for a wheat field, you know. Oh, damn. I don't know. Oh, she's <laughs> careful <then. laughs> <laughs> but yeah, carry on from your point. I, yeah, they're all sort of corrupt. Let's say that none of them are very. Well, not sort of. They're all corrupt. They're all corrupt. <laughs> so really, what, what, when you say corrupt, in what what kind of sense do you think they're corrupt? Well, well, you saw Theresa May living in a jaguar. I think it was. Who pays for that? <laughs> your mom, his mom, his dad, whatever. That's true. I'll pay for that. And she's, she was leaving the conservative hair Okay, which is the but, but, but then again, so okay, so we're now going to move across the pond, so to speak, for about it. You know, with the you know for the U.S. president's movements, for example, yeah, he's the leader of the free world. But do you not think you know having a protective limo that costs you know a couple million pounds, you know, bulletproof has his own blood supply in there, you know, oxygen supply, you know, the the, the you know the car can run without like tires, for example, you know, engine encased in how many like millimeters thick, you know, worth of bulletproof. All steel. the Americans pay for that in their taxes. Exactly. The but, American government's even more corrupt than this government, yeah. but all of them are corrupt. But, but not but people say you know you know on a fancy Jaguar. But, you know, that Jaguar is most likely bulletproofed. You know, in circumstances today, you know, Theresa May is probably under, you know, as, as I've seen, actually, you know, a lot of people, like, dislike her, you know, not pe- not, very me- not very people that really dislike Corbyn, but, like, a lot of really, yeah, like... A lot ex- of people dislike Corbyn. I've seen a lot... Cause my, so many people dislike my, my Corbyn. My Facebook is ram- rammed with people calling him, calling him IRA, anti-British. OK, but, but you know, people, because, you know, you said about, you know, the Jaguar like, money being spent on her Jaguar, you know, I I believe you know money. So it's not. So I I would understand for sat here. You know, extremely the Americans. She's got her own like private jumbo jet. Got her own like free helicopters. She flies with all the time. You know, and goes from massive convoys through the country. But she doesn't. You know, she uses. You know, she uses like one a British small British Airways plane when you know going on foreign trips. Um, you know, and she uses. She uses a Jaguar, you know, to just get around London. Obviously, you know, the Prime Minister isn't going to travel around in, like, a 1996 like a Citroen, is she? Yeah. They should. Obviously. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, but if, I'm not saying that, obviously, but they need a like, bit of protection, but, like, obviously. That is money get, that people are working for, that get, it's sort of going towards yeah. that. I feel like they should have some sort of protection, but when you have, like, the amount of protection, for example, Donald Trump, like, an yeah. oxygen you know, no, supply in his car. Theresa May, you know, Theresa May, you know, compared to other world leaders, you know, isn't actually that well protected, you know. I don't know, because there could be no secret things in place. But she's not actually a huge effect, you know. Like, if you look at, actually, in America, for example, you know, there's quite a lot of, you know, gun violence, for example. But if you look here in the UK, there's, like, barely any, so... Yeah, that's, that's due to the fact that they sell firearms. We don't. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, le- it's legal over there. But you know, I, I, f- I do think you know, I do believe in the fact you know, you know so the what trees. I would be, I would understand if you guys was that. You know, she's got a private limousine that's got like jet packs. Oh, no, I'm in not the back saying that. It. I'm just saying that it's corrupt. The government is corrupt. Like there's, I can guarantee if you to go, if you were to go through things, you'd see that there's millions of pounds that are like yeah, but that's not explained stuff. It's corrupt. Hey, well, like for example, there was this uh, massive scandal about uh, David Cameron's wife, yeah. uh, you know, spending all these thousands of thousands of pounds, you know, on her outfits. Yeah. But exactly. that's not just here, it's here in France, yeah. in Spain. The, 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 people could say, you know, you know, as a world leader, you know, you've got to keep up, like, 
a, a certain status about yourself and actually, you know, a first lady, you know, a wife of a prime minister, you know, a wife of a president, a wife, you know, a king, for example, has to keep up like a certain status. Like, you know, you wouldn't be happy if Theresa May, you know, turned up for a spe- speech wearing Adidas tracky bottoms. Honestly, I would. I'd be there like, God. Like, I'll feel, God. I'll feel honest, I'll feel identified with yeah. her when Adidas track oh. I think that, like, I mean, they're here for I the would people. love that. They're meant to be here for the people to help so the people, think, but they're not like us. She, she, she should turn up in you know, Adidas slides with I don't know. If it was slides, not the slides, but like, <laughs> they say we a bit Jeremy Corbyn is an Arsenal fan. He goes to every single home game from what they heard. But, but, and, but, but then and, you also have the thing, you know, does like, that, that doesn't make him a good... That doesn't yeah, define yeah, but him like, as a leader. Yeah, but like the majority of the politicians... That's what I mean. Like, you, you wouldn't trust... If you were just in the street, say, and, like, someone came up to him and was like... I don't know how to. I don't know where I'm going with this. No, I mean <laughs> like it, you just trust people who are like you more. And like, a lot more like you can relate to them more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And like That's with all of them, like but, but, they but, try people, to be people, like, oh, we understand und- what you I want. We're going to give the, you what the, you the, want. The, there's this massive thing, you know, in Parliament at the moment about, like, how, um, you know, people who are running the country, you know, can't relate to, like, the normal working-class citizen. Well, I totally understand, but, you know, people are acting like, you know, Corbyn's coming from a very unprivileged background. You know, the kid went to private school just like Theresa May. <laughs> and actually, I do agree with you. There needs to be more, like, po- like politics needs to be, you know, on offer to everyone. Like, everyone, you know, should have the chance to go to the mm-hmm. highest universities to study politics. And, you know, the opportunity to become you know, a red local an MP for example, or the opportunity to become, you know, but obviously we're still getting rid of the stereotypes. Like like Nas said earlier, you know, we've had over two hundred female MPs elected and uh, like how many disabled MPs elected? Uh, there were two disabled MPs in two. So, you know, we're already breaking down barriers on, you know, stereotypes there and I actually I actually see and I do think Jeremy Corbyn can be, you know, ahead of a movement, you know, that says actually, you know, anyone can get into politics if they have the power, you know, if they have the passion to do it and the fire in their bellies to do it. Uh, yeah. to so I think with Jeremy Corbyn what we were talking earlier about it being refreshing. I think it's re- it, with Jeremy Corbyn, it's refreshing to have someone who's not been to private school, who's... who's yeah, he has, he been, has been to private school. school. Was he? Yeah, he was well, private okay. education. Who, who went, who was in, he was in public education for... Well, he, he had been to public education. Yeah, well, no, he, he has, you know, he has experienced it. You know? yeah. And actually, the man, you know, I would say, you know, it's more down-to-earth than Theresa May, for example. I can tell you an instantial point on that. But, you know... But also, I, I, this you know, could be a bit controversial. What I'm about to say, Ooh. but, Ooh. but, but surely, for example, I can I can't sit here and say I'd be able to do a good job as prime minister. Or can any I of think you? you would. I don't no. think any of us could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because you, nah. you know you, you don't know that you know you, we see all this stuff, but you don't know the pressures you know going on behind the scene. You know, there's those top secret stuff that can be going on, like pressures. You know, all these plots and stuff like that, and like people say, oh yeah, yeah, I, I could do that job well. I would like to see people try do that job because you know Theresa May, you know, bless her, like all the leaders, for example, they've been up all night for all day yesterday, all night. Haven't only had what half an hour, an hour sleep or so while traveling, you know, to their constituencies and back to London again. I just, I feel like a lot of people should appreciate, you know, yeah. Pol- politicians yeah, more. Yeah, I, I think they, but they, they, they do do that, but I think, like, I don't know. they do this once every yeah few it's not that big. Mm. like there are people around up and down the country who work like shifts like this every night nearly yeah people who work their butts off to make minimum wage something that they're arguing over and they're talking about how but, they think they should it, but also like i think you know i i believe you know the government's also done a like, kind of a decent job as well on actually sorting out that minimum wage as well like it is you know yeah. at quite substantial levels all the people behind the scenes are people we don't see the people we don't get to talk about the people that are like we like all of them they deserve a lot of credit yeah and being in, being uh, especially if you're like let's say a public figure or someone running for even someone running for your local for your local mm. um, constituency there's a lot of pressure on you because people are judging you as a person or as with your policies, they they're not just judging your policies. They judge you. They judge what you say. They, some some this isn't correct. This is not correct. But they they sometimes even judge out what you look like. It's a lot more pressure than so people actually. So do do you think? Okay, so you know when Jerry Corbyn was first elected Labour leader, it's the first time I ever heard of him actually. You know, I remember reading a news article that just described him as a rogue rat in politics. Not obviously, you know. Rat in the bad sense, obviously, you know, rat in the sense of like he was, he was a bit unexpected, really. Yeah. Um, do Do you think that so when he first came to power, you know, he didn't really, he didn't like wore a suit with like didn't really wear like a proper suit with no tie. Mm-hmm. I reportedly, you know, on multiple candidates sing the national anthem. Do you think, you know, 
he is like obviously you know the government is formed under the queen and a lot of people are saying you know we don't need the royal family anymore what's everyone's you know opinion on like want people wanting to abolish the well with, with him with, with what you're saying there with him him saying that he doesn't agree with with the royal family and things like that i think it's good that he's actually said that because it's standing up for what he actually believes in instead of instead of shying away from it and not not speaking out i think it's good that he he's actually said it so people can see that he's act, he's real he's, he's what he's saying but i think with, with the um with the queen i think there's a lot of or with the queen and the royal family people saying we should get rid of it i think there's multiple different arguments for both sides for example yeah it's using up a lot of um the council's money for, uh, people call them benefit scroungers and things like that yeah it's using a lot of money um, i think it also brings the, money was, to the country there was the, yeah there was statistics brought out that the average taxpayer pays uh, 35p towards the royal family every year 35p every year every year well, how many inhabitants does it also but, but, that, but then you also, like, like, like you just said, Sam, actually, you know, the reverse side of actually the tourism and the economic benefits the royal family brings in probably outweighs that by millions and millions of that pounds. That's true. Like, for example, people you know, could say, you know, abolish, you know, the monarchy, you know, it's just a waste of taxpayers' money. And actually, if you look at it, you know, 35p per taxpayer isn't, isn't substantial to how much people tax actually pay, you know. You're missing out on a flump, it's, it's not really that much. Exactly, and actually for what it brings in, you know, pe people, I know people who have become, you know, heard stories of people coming, especially to the UK, just to see, you know, about the royal family, you know, go to Buckingham Palace and stuff, and I do, you know, and I'm, I'm a strong believer, you know, yeah. that actually, yeah, the royal family, you know, they don't hold any political power anymore. But they're still like, you know, the the government is formed in Her Majesty's name. I'm going to play devil's advocate, devil's advocate here. As I, as I said, um, you're missing out on the flump. But then people could also argue back saying that 35p, which is everyone's paying. I'm going to go back to using the NHS as an example. Again, I use this a lot. But um, that 35p, if everyone paid 35p towards the NHS instead of the, instead of the royal family, then the NHS would be a lot more funded. The royal family have a lot, or maybe in, in terms of paying fifteen p towards the royal family and but, twenty p towards it. But then, but then again, in the sense of you do, you know, I can't, I can't see it happening anytime soon. I'm not gonna lie, you know, like the British family has like support from. Like, I've never really met someone who's gone, you know, a bottle. I've met one person, but who you know, gone abolish the monarchy, you know, don't like the queen and stuff. Because at the end of the day, you know, the queen holds now holds no political power. You know, she can't, she can't turn around and be like, no, I'm not signing this bill. She has to constitutionally. Um. Sorry to cut you short. Uh, we have breaking news from the UKIP uh, leadership. Oh, yeah. UKIP uh, leader is running. Um, let's actually uh, take a listen uh, to this speech. Has been, what is the relevance of UKIP now? Well, I contend, even after the difficult night last night, that UKIP is more relevant than it ever was. This is because UKIP are more now than ever after last night's result, the guard dogs of Brexit. And the Prime Minister, and I suspect it will be a Tory, must know that if they begin to backtrack or barter things away, then they must know they will be punished at the ballot box. And that will only happen if UKIP is electorally viable and strong. We are, in effect, the country's insurance policy on Brexit. UKIP has also proved its relevance by leading the agenda in many ways in this election. To give you one example, we were the first to talk about the greater need for integration and the threats posed to our people from the growing cancer of Islamist extremism in our midst. Unfortunately, the recent attacks in Manchester and London have proved we were correct. I would also argue on many other issues we have led and others have followed. We put down a manifesto that not only highlighted many of the issues we now face, but came up with common sense remedies. Indeed, I called it a manifesto that was a decade ahead of its time. And I am more confident now than ever that many of our proposals in the 2017 manifesto will either be government policy or adopted by the establishment parties before the next general election. I believe in the long term, some of our policy proposals are inevitable, such as an English parliament or a full face ban on a full face coverings ban. I am proud to have stood on a platform 
of policies that included getting immigration under control, slashing the, the bloated foreign aid budget, reversing the cuts to our police force and increasing the size of our armed forces. I contend that if UKIP is to prosper, it must continue to be the outriders of British politics. The party that leads the debate and does not follow. The party that is not hamstrung by political correctness and therefore straight talks and says what everybody else is thinking. If UKIP sticks to these principles, then I believe it will flourish in future years. Indeed, I even predict, after last night, that if things go the way I expect, then UKIP could, in 18 months' time, be bigger in terms of poll ratings and members than it ever has been before. However, it will not be with me as its leader. I am standing down today as the leader of UKIP with immediate effect. This will allow the party to have a new leader in place by the conference in September. And at the annual conference in Torquay, the new rebranded UKIP must be launched and a new era must begin with a new leader. This will be an exciting time for all of us who love our party. I have to admit that I never envisaged that I would lead the party into three by-elections and a general election in the space of six hectic months. I wanted at least a year of calm to rebrand and rebuild the party structures so we were ready for the electoral battles ahead. But alas... Nuttall is standing down as... Uh... Uh, so obviously a uh, huge, uh, well, not really a surprise there due to uh, UKIP's performance overnight. Uh, now, what are your uh, opinions on uh, UKIP uh, leader obviously resigning there? I don't really know, to be honest. Do you think, you know, it's quite fair of him to resign, you know, given UKIP's, you know, the, the results last I night? I think given, compared to last time, they have uh, far less <laughs> votes compared to last time. Well, they've like, got none. Uh, they've got no seats. seats. They've got zero seats compared to last time. But obviously last time they were pledging for that referendum to leave the EU. Now they have nothing to, no talking points at all. So it's not really surprising they got no seats. And al also that makes it a lot easier now. It makes it more, more in shape for Nigel Farage for, to return uh, to the UK leadership. I was watching, um uh, so, do you, actually, well, while we're on the point of Nigel, sorry to interrupt you there, yeah, Sam, on on the point of uh, Nigel Farage, there, do you think, do you think, you know, he will, you know, might slide back in there as uh, UKIP leader? Well, I was, uh, oh. so I was just saying, um, on the on the news area, some there was an interview with Nigel Farage, and he was, um, and the person interviewing him was saying how UKIP's pretty much done terrible since um, since Nigel Farage left. So, so in fact, it might be in UKIP's best interest to re to retrieve him or, or get him back. If not, they need someone similar and someone definitely who's going to do better than um, was his name Paul Nuttall? Yeah, yeah. Paul, Paul Nuttall yeah. did. Okay. Uh, so obviously, you know, uh, well, not really surprising revelations there with the UKIP leader resigning, uh, given UKIP's um, performance last night. But an interesting statistic there: uh, UKIP actually had more votes. Uh, generally across the country uh, last night then Green Party the Green Party are the one with the one MP with UKIP with zero this is what I said um, earlier yes yeah, so do you think you know obviously you know we've already spoken about you know obviously uh, changing you know the way people vote and how and how it's voted um, do you think people should you know should get a should have I've kind of, I've kind of lost words here do you think um, I, I've, I've totally forgotten my point here. I don't really know where I'm taking this. Uh, well, actually, uh, moving on, actually, we'll, we'll move on there. Obviously, you know, the UKIP leader signing, um, and obviously, obviously, Nigel Farage maybe go back in. Obviously, he is the oh, founding dear. father of the party. But you know, g you know, to be fair, Nigel Farage, you know, he is very extreme. And, you know, sometimes low key racist. Uh, low key, <laughs> low key low racist. Key racist. Just, little bit. Uh, just, you know, Can't be racist. His wife's German. <laughs> You're joking. She actually, he has, of he she does is. have a well-enjoyed uh, German like wife. Uh, well, very sorry to see 
Paul not to stepping down, he said. Yeah. Very uh, sorry. Yeah. He says yeah, he's sure very is. sorry, but <laughs> he's uh, like, I'm going to get back in again. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so obviously, we know now ju- uh, jumping uh, across, you know, a little bit of the way. Obviously, you know, America last year electing president good old Donald Trump as their, uh, you know, leader of the free world, so to put it. Um, what do you think, you know, uh, now, what do you think, you know, the uh, US politics reaction is to this? Well, in terms of this, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, oh, has oh. obviously said that people are revolting against austerity, apparently, and, um, well, he's delighted to see Labour do so well, to be honest. He said, um, his quote from him, all over the world, people are rising up against austerity and massive levels of income and wealth inequality. People in the UK, the US and elsewhere want governments to represent all the people, not just the 1%. Uh, so, which news agency published that one? Uh, this is on... Sorry, the, the Independent. Independent. OK, so obviously, you know, the Independent they're publishing. Uh, but it was known from the start that Bernie, you know, Bernie, I, I would call Bernie Sanders, you know, the a Corbyn American equivalent. Would yeah, you Would you not agree I with me? I love Bernie Sanders. He is one of the only people that I've ever seen stand up for something. And there is proof of him fighting for black rights in in the 70s. Like, that's just, just proves how authentic he is and how, honestly, with the people he is, like... He is also, like we said earlier, you want someone that you sort of relate to. I don't necessarily relate to him, he's like a 70-year-old white man, but still, he makes me sort of relate to him and make me want to vote for yeah. him, but I wasn't even American. And for a person that grew up in the 40s, 50s, yeah, yeah. 60s, when racism was rampant, it, it, it wasn't at its peak, but it was pretty high. I mean, it's... There is, oh, there is one photo that I'm never, ever going to fit. It's literally a photo of him being dragged by police fighting for black rights. And I just don't think you could ever have someone who is more sort of with the people. Well, well, politician well. Obviously, obviously, you know, about to, I'm about to giantly sway away from, you know, our politics and obviously why we're here today. Do you think, you know, Bernie could have won the election of Iran instead of Hillary? Yes. He could have if... I think if you know, more young people had voted, and then and but, if they hadn't been so but stupid, and then, to vote but in then obviously rate. you know the domino effect being that, do you know? Do you think you know Theresa May would have called this election if she thinks she had you know, more backing from America? Because obviously you know, you know Bernie Sanders has come out and said you know, you know J- Jeremy Corbyn, I suppose Jeremy Corbyn, you know obviously Donald Trump and Theresa May, you know obviously trying to strengthen some kind of relationship. Yeah, you know there's that famous picture of you know Trump helping Theresa May down the stairs and it looks like they're holding hands and like a husband and wife for example. More than he also had to this point. An interesting thing about that is um, he, when when he was talking about when with Brexit. Um, Donald Trump said he would prioritise the e uh, a trade deal with the EU a lot more than he would well definitely well, not a lot more but in front of one with the UK so that's one thing we need to slightly think about. Well, well, tr- you know, you know Donald Trump, you know, in his election campaign, he was very happy for us to leave the European Union. You know, he was very much in favour of us doing it. And actually, you know, I think now, you know, Theresa May, you know, becoming the biggest party with, well, obviously, what looks like to be a DNP coalition, sorry, DUP coalition. You know, and I and I think like you know, Trump has probably you know spoken to Theresa May, if not, he will in the next few hours and congratulate her. Well, which hasn't been what the Conservatives wanted, but at the end of the day, is a Conservative victory. Which is, but I would say there's actually been two winners tonight, and it has been, you know, Conservatives and the Labour Party. You know, both parties actually, you know, neither leader having good reason to resign. You know, who, you know, the polls were saying, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, you know, would get some kind of shocking result here. You know, if only like roughly 200 seats or so, or 220, you know, between the mark. And you know, and actually, you know, coming out with 261, it's a massive win for him. He has not won the election, but he certainly has won the hearts of the young people, which are actually the future of the UK. So, you know, I actually reckon in the next election, you know, when a lot of people, you know, are Age, for example, because obviously, you know, I'll reiterate, none of us here are actually legally able to vote, and all of us have strong political opinions. And I feel like in the in the next election, you know, Jer- Jer- you know, if Jeremy Corbyn is still Labour leader, I, have, I reckon he has a good chance to get the majority. I, I doubt he will be due to his age. If Jeremy Corbyn was like 20, 25 years younger, but then if he was, this uh, is the thing as well. If he was younger, view, would he be Labour leader? If he was younger, I don't think he'd be taken as seriously as he is. Mm. Like. The young, the younger you are, I feel like the less mature you are viewed, and the less your yeah. opinions are really valued, almost. The, so if you, if he was, if he was younger, I don't think he would have gotten as far as he but has. But the day we get a serious young politician, that will be the, that will be, the day everything will change. Yeah. On the subject, on the subject of young people, um, I, what's everyone's views on votes at sixteen? Um, 
I believe, I actually believe, well, I'm kind of, you know, 50-50 about it. I believe, yeah. you know, yeah. I believe that young people, you know, do uh, quite, like, quite a lot of young people, obviously, in this election, you know, has actually been really good for just politics in general because it's really put it in the spotlight for young people. And, you know, obviously a lot of young people, you know, like, obviously liking Jeremy Corbyn and the way he's doing things is obviously different and he's captured their attention. But also, there's also the fact, you know, of 16-year-olds, you know, you know, they don't, like, pay you know, much into the world. They haven't lived as long, obviously. Yeah. And, and many uh, many 16-year-olds don't know what they want in life at all. Yeah, like. yeah. Well, maybe this is what I, I, I would say, because I had to think about this. And I think if we did give um, just straight up the, the vote to vote to 16 to, let's say, every 16-year-old, there would be quite a few who take it for granted, Yeah. take the opportunity for granted. Maybe there could be some sort of system where they could prove... That yeah. They should be allowed to vote, and you, but, but then again, you know, you could get like well, that's like putting it as an IQ test. It's not really a democracy, yeah. but that's then because then you have the then you have like a counter argument of you know actually you're choosing intelligence, you know, over people's views, and everyone's entitled. But to not so in the USA, but more in the knowledge, 1940s, yeah, more knowledge, it used of, to be. Knowledge, knowledge, of knowledge of politics, of knowledge of stuff like that, or like. Not so do you think there should be like an application process? So yeah. It off, yeah. And then like reasoning why you would vote and why yeah. you want to vote, not necessarily like selling, telling the party who would back. Yeah. Because obviously exactly. you could get a bit biased there. But you know, application system of you know, because it was said as well. You know, David Cameron, you know, spoke about you know in the EU referendum, you know, votes be going to young, young, you know, sixteen and seventeen year olds, and it was said, you know, maybe if they were allowed to vote, it could have pushed it back over to exactly. us remaining in. Well, we wouldn't be in this mess, would we? <laughs> obviously yeah. wouldn't but if i was like say 16 year olds were allowed to vote if i were to vote yes yesterday i wouldn't know who to vote for i, I, I don't think many yeah. people will be in yeah. that situation I, I think maybe schools could also do a little bit more to um so do you think politics yeah this is this is also what i've been hearing you know as i was watching throughout the night you know a lot a lot of young people you know well, a lot of people have just said in general how politics should be more into the education system and edu not necessarily a biased opinion on it, but how politics works, you know. Like, I didn't know to what, you know, the last election, what austerity meant. Like, there's all these big words being thrown around and, like, it should be, like, more engaged, you know. Like, well, it's still only, what, 75% voter turnout. That's still a lot of people who have, like, a couple of million people who haven't put their opinion forward. Definitely. I just don't... I really don't think it's taught well enough because I've, I've had to self-teach myself... About, yeah. about I, th I think I think most of us sat around the table of you know self taught ourselves yeah, on politics in general. If, if we listen to our parents, we'll be completely biased towards it's exactly one side. I, but I, if you teach yourself, see, Labour, you see Conservative, Green, whatever, you just. But then, but then, like you know, like the whole like so. For example, you know, in this section, you know, I've witnessed people, you know, like for example, um, I noticed um, someone was going through my Facebook, you know, support of Tory, which is actually like very rare for young people to, you know, openly turn out and say, you know, I'm like I am Tory and I don't believe in Jeremy Corbyn. I come and like, no, you're wrong. For example, this and like, there's been a lot of kind of aggression towards this, you know, saying people's opinion is wrong because yeah. people have to remember, you know, people will vote for a certain party because it's their opinion, not right or wrong you know people could say oh yeah it's wrong of jeremy corbyn to say this is wrong of that you know actually it's not wrong it's his opinion yeah exactly. i think that's fine just as long as you don't sort of slander people i feel like that's a bit yeah. low yeah like uh, when people are like name calling yeah when for people example. are saying harsh things about jeremy corbyn like it get it's funny sometimes but then you get to a point where it's just like it's just unnecessary i saw um there was this youtuber so he's got obviously got big influence in in people's decisions the heat I, I was looking at some of the things he was putting out on social media and there was a lot of name calling towards Labour voters. I won't mention the YouTuber's name, but uh, he but he was saying things like anyone who votes Labour is a benefit scrounger. Yeah, which is which is kind of unfair because, you know, pe people will, you know, promote, you know, will support like a certain political party literally just based on uh, their opinion. Um, yeah, and their life experience and their, let, let's say their, their job, their, their social their social experiences, their current um, st stature st in life, it's just where they work, everything. It, it could. It's not just. So it's, it's it basically based on who you are as a person, what you do. It's it's not not to be for people to say, oh, this person is a benefit scrounger. That uh, all of this. I think a lot of the names thrown are very immature and people people have the reasons for voting they do, to one yeah. party or, or another so Background. i think everyone should be respected yeah. for who they vote yeah if you vote conservative you might have your reason for it if you vote labor you might have your reason for it like personally professionally you don't know what what's going on in everyone's life you don't know why exactly. they're voting for that party exactly. okay so um obviously you know we've um 
we obviously covered a lot this morning, and I, and I feel like the majority of us, you know, have put our opinions across. Um, so obviously, you know, moving on, we know we kind of touched on, you know, how American politics might impact um, in like what's happened tonight. Um, do you think Donald, after you know, after what's happened recent events, and obviously, obviously, what happened uh, unfortunately last uh, weekend on London Bridge, and then uh, obviously, you know, uh, Trump, you know, uh, excruciatingly like slating uh, the London mayor for what he's saying. Um, do you think that would have uh, really done Trump any favours if, you know, if it had totally switched around and Labour, you know, did come up with a majority or not? Pardon? So do, do you think, so do you think... Yes. OK, uh, that um, American politics would have, would have had a massive impact on the vote that happened, the general election tonight, do you think? Yeah, because mm -hmm. I think when, when it came to the American election, Afterwards, there was a lot of people that came forward and said, I wish I'd gone and voted now because not, no one was really happy with the way it turned out. So everyone had thought, yeah, we like, and I feel like this time people have realised that and they're like, this is why we need to vote because we need to take charge of what we want for our future, which well, is, like I said, why so many young people probably would have voted. Also, more than 30% of the population didn't vote. Yeah, and like everyone had such strong opinions on it, but like, this was the turnout and barely anyone voted. I mean, 30% in America, 60, 60, 90 million, roughly, around 80, 90 million. It's ridiculous, but also I think Donald Trump needs to keep his mouth shut. Like, Donald I feel Trump like he just doesn't think about some of the stuff he says sometimes, and it's just ridiculous. Well, he hasn't said anything yet. We're all still waiting yes. for his tweet. Yeah, yet. <laughs> We're still waiting for well, his well, tweet over the election. Well, I'm guessing, you know, obviously, you know, America... It's, it's not very, you know, they have, they have only just really, the, you know, it's very early hours in the morning in America, yeah. obviously, you know, and obviously, you know, we'll obviously get some... Donald some, Trump, he needs some sleep, obviously. 70-year-old man needs to rest. Well, apparently it's reported Donald Trump only sleeps for four hours every night. Oof. That's a bit crazy. What's up? 4 a.m. to 8 a.m.? Should be. Mm. Well, um, obviously... Uh, I always a lot think Donald Trump didn't know what he was getting himself into. Like, well, in my head, I feel like he must have thought, oh, presidency. Okay, um, okay, so, um, so obviously, um, so we'll, I think what we're actually going to do is obviously, I think most of us are keen to see, you know, what comes out at 12.30 with Theresa May. So I think what we've decided is we are now going to take a break and we're going to come back on air at quarter to 12. So we're now going to take a break for 45 minutes, come back at quarter to 12 and uh, watch as uh, Prime Minister does her certain speech and this and that. So we will be back for you at uh, quarter past 12, sorry, I mean quarter to 12, and we will see you then. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you later for part two. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in.